The dietary guidelines recommend that we try to choose meals or snacks that are high in nutrients but lower in calories to reduce the risk of chronic disease. By this measure, the healthiest foods on the planet, the most nutrient-dense, are vegetables, containing the most nutrient bang for our caloric buck. So what would happen if a population centered their entire diet around vegetables? They might end up living among the longest lives in the world. Of course, any time you hear about long-living populations, you have to make sure it's validated, as it may be hard to find birth certificates from the 1890s. But validation studies suggest that indeed they really do live that long. The traditional diet in Okinawa is based on vegetables, beans, and other plants. I'm used to seeing the Okinawan diet represented like this, the base being vegetables, beans, and grains, but a substantial contribution from fish and other meat. But a more accurate representation would be this. If you look at their actual dietary intake, we know what they're eating from the U.S. National Archives, because the U.S. military ran Okinawa until it was given back to, Japanese, uh, to Japan in 72. Uh, and if you look at the traditional diets of more than 2,000 Okinawans, this is how it breaks down. Only 1% of their diet was fish. Less than 1% of their diet was meat, and same with eggs and dairy. So it was more than 96% plant-based, and more than 90% whole food plant-based, very few processed foods either. And not just whole food plant-based, but most of their diet was vegetables, and one vegetable in particular, sweet potatoes. The Okinawan diet was centered around purple and orange sweet potatoes. How delicious is that? Could have been bitter gourd or soursop, but no, sweet potatoes. So, 90 plus percent whole food plant-based makes it a highly anti-inflammatory diet, makes it a highly antioxidant diet. If you measure the level of oxidized fat within their system, there's compelling evidence of less free radical damage. Maybe they're just genetically have better antioxidant enzymes or something? No. Their antioxidant enzyme activity is the same. It's all the extra antioxidants they're getting from their diet that may be making the difference. Most of their diet is vegetables. So, 8 to 12 times fewer heart disease deaths than the U.S. You can see they ran out of room for the graph for our death rate. 2 to 3 times fewer colon cancer deaths. Seven times fewer prostate cancer deaths, and five and a half times lower risk of dying from breast cancer. Some of this protection may be because they're only eating about 1,800 calories a day, but they were actually eating a greater mass of food, but the you know, whole plant foods are just calorically dilute. There's also a cultural norm not to stuff oneself. The plant based nature of the diet may trump the caloric restriction, though, since the one population that lives even longer than the Okinawa Japanese don't just eat a 98% meat-free diet, they eat 100% meat-free. The Adventist vegetarians in California, with perhaps the highest life expectancy of any formally described population. Adventist vegetarian men and women live to be about 83 and 86, comparable to Okinawan women, but better than Okinawan men. The best of the best were Adventist vegetarians who had healthy lifestyles too, like being exercising non-smokers. 87 and nearly 90 on average. Uh, that's like 10 to 14 years longer than the general population. 10 to 14 extra years on this earth from simple lifestyle choices. And this is happening now in modern times, whereas Okinawan longevity is now a thing of the past. Okinawa now hosts more than a dozen KFCs. Their saturated fat tripled. They went from eating essentially no cholesterol to a few Big Macs worth, tripled their sodium, and are now just as potassium deficient as Americans, getting less than half of the recommended minimum daily intake of 4,700 milligrams a day. In two generations, Okinawans have gone from the leanest Japanese to the fattest. As a consequence, there's been a resurgence of interest from public health professionals in getting Okinawans to eat the Okinawan diet too.
Immanuel Kant, the 18th century philosopher, described the chemistry of his day as a science, but not really science, because it wasn't grounded in mathematics, at least not until a century later. The same could be said for biology, the study of life. In math and physics, quantum physics, there are constants, physical quantities thought to be both universal and unchanging. Biology, though, was considered too complex, too messy to be governed by simple natural laws. But in 1999, a theoretical high-energy physicist from Los Alamos joined up with two biologists to describe universal scaling laws that appear to apply across the board. Are there any clinical implications of these kind of theories? Well, a fascinating observation was published. The number of heartbeats per lifetime is remarkably similar, whether you're a hamster all the way up to a whale. So even though mice only live less than two years, their heart rate is like 5 to 600 beats a minute, up to 10 beats a second, whereas the heart of a Galapagos tortoise beats 100 times slower, but they live about 100 times longer. There's such a remarkable consistency in the number of heartbeats animals get in their lifetimes that a provocative question was asked. Can human life be extended by cardiac slowing? In other words, if humans are predetermined to have about 3 billion heartbeats period in a lifetime, then would a reduction in average heart rate extend life? This is not just some academic question. If that's how it worked, then one might estimate that a reduction in heart rate from more of an average you know, 70 beats per minute down to what many athletes have, 60 beats per minute, could theoretically increase lifespan over a decade. Seems a bit off the wall, but that's how the scientific method works. You start out with an observation, like this striking heartbeat data, and then you make an educated guess or hypothesis that you can then put to the test. How might one demonstrate a life-prolonging effect of cardiac slowing in humans? Well, perhaps a first attempt in this direction would be to see if people with low, you know, slower hearts live longer lives, lamenting the fact that there's no drug that just lowered heart rate that they could give to people, since drugs like beta blockers lower heart rate, but also lower blood pressure, so it wouldn't be ideal for uh, testing the question at hand. But at least we could do that first part about do people with slower hearts live longer lives. And indeed, from the evidence accumulated so far, we know that a high resting heart rate, meaning how fast our heart beats when you're just sitting at rest, is associated with an increase in mortality in the general population as well as those with chronic disease. A fasting heart rate may lead to a faster death rate. Faster resting heart rates are associated with shorter life expectancies, considered a strong independent risk factor for heart disease and heart failure. Uh, you can see how those with the higher heart rates are about twice as likely over the next 15 years to experience heart failure. In middle-aged people, and older people, in men, and women, and what's critical is that this link between how fast our heart goes and how fast our life goes is independent of physical activity. I mean, at first I was like, well, duh, of course lower resting heart rates are associated with a longer lifespan. Who has a really slow pulse? Athletes. As you can see, the more physically fit we are, the lower our resting pulse. But no, they found that irrespective of level of physical fitness, people with higher resting heart rates fare worse than people with lower heart rates. So it appears it's not just a marker of risk, but a bona fide risk factor, independent of how fit we are or how much we exercise. Why? Well, our heart rate is, if our heart rate is up you know, 24 hours a day, even when we're sleeping, all that pulsatile stress may break some of the elastic fibers within the arterial wall, causing our arteries to become stiff. It doesn't allow enough time for our arteries to relax between beats, and so the faster our heart, the stiffer our arteries. But there are all sorts of theories how an increased resting heart rate could decrease our time on Earth. Regardless, this relationship is now well recognized. It's not just a marker of an underlying pathology. It's not merely a marker of inflammation. Uh, the reason it's important to distinguish a risk factor from a risk marker is that if you control the risk factor, you control the risk. But if it's just a risk marker, it wouldn't matter if we brought our heart rate down. 
But now we even have evidence from drug trials, now that there actually are medications that just affect heart rate, that lowering our heart rate lowers our death rate. It's now been shown in at least a dozen trials so far. Uh, basically, we don't want our heart to be beating more than about one beat per second at rest. You can measure your pulse right now. For the maximum lifespan, the target is like one beat a second to beat the clock. Uh, but don't worry if you're too fast. Heart rate is a modifiable risk factor. Yes, there are drugs, but there are also lifestyle regimens that can bring our resting pulse down which I'll cover next. Physical inactivity has been called the biggest public health problem of the 21st century. Of course, just because someone calls it that doesn't mean it's true. In fact, physical inactivity ranks down at number five in terms of risk factors for death, and number six in terms of risk factors for disability. Diet is by far our greatest killer, followed by smoking. But still, there is irrefutable evidence of the effectiveness of regular physical activity in the prevention of several chronic diseases— cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, obesity, depression, and osteoporosis, as well as premature death, adding an additional one or two years onto our lifespan, helping to add years to our life and, above all, life to our years. It truly may be survival of the fittest. How much do we need to exercise? In general, the answer is the more the better. Currently, most health and fitness organizations advocate a minimum of 1,000 calories burned of exercise a week, which is like walking an hour a day, five days a week. But seven days a week may be even better in terms of extending one's lifespan. Moderate intensity can be practically defined by the talk-but-not-sing test, where you can still carry on a conversation, but would feel breathless if trying to sing. Exercise is so important that not walking an hour a day is considered a high-risk behavior, alongside smoking, excess drinking, and being obese. Having any one of these effectively ages us three to five years in terms of risk of dying prematurely. Though interestingly, those that ate green vegetables on a daily basis did not appear to have that same bump in risk. Uh, but even if broccoli-eating couch potatoes do live as long as walkers, uh, there are a multitude of ancillary health benefits to physical activity, so much so that doctors are encouraged to prescribe it, to signal to the patient that exercise is medicine, in fact, powerful medicine. Researchers at the London School, Harvard, and Stanford compared exercise to drug interventions, and found that exercise often worked just as well as drugs for the treatment of heart disease and stroke, the prevention of diabetes. Of course, there's not a lot of money to fund exercise studies, so one option would be to require drug companies to compare any new drug to exercise. In cases where drug options provide only modest benefit, patients deserve to understand the relative impact that physical activity might have on their condition. We could throw diet into the mix, too. Yes, the FDA could tell drug companies, your new drug beats out placebo, but does it work as well as kale? This recent review noting that 
vegan diets, in part because they tend to be naturally low in methionine, and may prove to be a useful nutritional strategy in cancer growth control, also looked at methionine restriction and lifespan extension. It seems that the less methionine there is in body tissues, the longer different animals tend to live. But what are the possible implications for humans? I've talked before about the free radical theory of aging, this concept that aging can be thought of as the oxidation of our bodies, just like rust is the oxidation of metal. And methionine is thought to have a pro-oxidant effect. So the thinking is that lower methionine intake leads to less free radical production, the so-called reactive oxygen species, which slows the rate of DNA damage, which then would slow the rate of DNA mutation, slowing the rate of aging and disease, thereby potentially increasing our lifespan. There are three ways to lower methionine intake. Caloric restriction, they call it dietary restriction here, meaning like you cut your intake of food in half, for example, only eating every other day, that would lower your methionine intake. Or because methionine is found concentrated in certain proteins, you could practice protein restriction across the board, eating a relatively protein-deficient diet. Or the third option is to eat enough food, eat enough protein, but just eat plant proteins because they are relatively low in methionine. Caloric restriction is hard, because we walk around starving all the time. Something you know, like every other day eating is never likely to gain much popularity as a pro-longevity strategy for humans, so it may be more feasible to achieve moderate methionine restriction in light of the fact that plant-based diets tend to be relatively low in this amino acid. As we've seen, you know, plant products tend to be lower in methionine than animal products. Yes, protein restriction across the board can be performed to avoid the hunger of caloric restriction. But again, methionine restriction could also be performed emphasizing low methionine, high-quality vegetable sources of protein. Among foods containing plant proteins, legumes are especially rich in essential amino acids, offering excellent substitutes for proteins of animal origin. The fact that beans have comparatively low methionine has been classically considered a disadvantage. But given the capacity of methionine restriction to decrease the rate of free radical generation in internal organs, to lower markers of chronic disease, and to increase maximum longevity, ironically converts such a quote-unquote disadvantage into a strong advantage, and fits well within the important role of beans in healthy diets like the traditional Mediterranean diet. Interestingly, you know, soy protein is also especially poor in methionine, and it's widely considered that soy-containing foods have healthy effects in human beings. Now, on a population level, folks could benefit from just lowering their protein intake, period. The mean intake of proteins, and thus methionine, of Western human populations is much higher than needed. Therefore, decreasing such levels has a great potential to lower tissue oxidative stress and to increase healthy lifespan in humans, while avoiding the possible undesirable effects of caloric restriction. We're eating you know, twice uh, you know, uh, as much protein as we need, uh, so the you know, first thing we can recommend is just decreasing the intake of protein. You know, it has a large potential to bring about health benefits. But then we can lower methionine even further, eating a plant-based diet. The reason plant-based diets are so protective is not known. Yes, vegetables contain thousands of phytochemicals, but separately investigating their possible protective roles would be an impossible task. The idea that the protective effect is not due to any of the individual plant food components, but to a synergistic combined effect, is gaining acceptance. However, based on the relationship of excess dietary methionine with toxicity to major vital organs, and its likely mechanism of action through increase in free radical generation, the possibility exists that the protective effects of plant-based diets can be due, at least in part, to their lower methionine content. This is not a new idea. It was proposed back in 2009, but is only now gaining increasing acceptance in more mainstream scientific circles. The idea that low methionine content of vegan diets may make methionine restriction feasible as a life extension strategy.